What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the Big Dog's Gotta Eat Fantasy Football channel. As always, it's your boy Nick, repping some Big Dog gear. If you wanna check out the shop, I'll link it here, as well as in the description. We got t-shirts, crewnecks, hats, all the good stuff. But today, we're getting back into the team outlooks. We're finishing up the last division, the AFC South. Because it's Team Outlook Thursday, baby. Two more today, two more next Tuesday, and we are officially closed out with Team Alex, and I can get to some more important shit, baby. We're gonna kick it off with the Houston Houston, U U U U U, I, I think that's how they spell it, right? U U U S T O N, Texans. So if you enjoy the video, please scroll down a little bit, hit that thumbs up button. If you've been enjoying the team outlooks, do that anyways. Let's get cracking. So you look at the Texans over the last few years, right? Since head coach Bill O'Brien came in, they're usually a top-ranked defense. Their offense, however, took a turn for the worst when they handed the keys to the $70 billion man, Brock the Cock Osweiler, man. Thankfully for Houston fans, that era came and went quicker than me with a Barstool Smoke Show. Almost nothing went right for Houston last year. They're predicated on hard-nosed defense, ground-and-pound offense. Ended up finishing 14th in pass attempts per game. Normally, when you run the ball so much, you, you want to scale back on passing. That's not what happened. Despite finishing 14th in pass attempts, they finished 29th in passing yards. 3,176 yards which is awful for today's NFL. They rank dead last in both completions of 20 plus yards and completions of 40 plus yards. They only have four. There are 26 wideouts in the NFL that had that many completions of 40 yards or more. So 26 guys, individual guys, had as many as the Texans did. But now that Osweiler's gone, we look to the new era of quarterback. The battle between Tom Savage and Deshaun Watson. Two completely different guys, right? You got Tom Savage, 27 years old, been in the league for a little bit. Sean Watson, rookie out of Clemson. We've seen this scenario plenty of times, right? You have the rookie come in, you have the okay, mediocre, older, white quarterback who's the veteran, and it usually doesn't end up well for the rookie in this scenario, at least at the beginning of the season. Savage is, is the safe play. He's actually been with Houston since 2014. He's only attempted 92 passes over that span. Being with the team that long, it not only has continuity, but you know the offense really well, so it makes the coaching staff much more comfortable with you under center. He's got a good build. He's about 6'4", uh, 225 to 230 in that range. He's a pocket quarterback. No scrambling upside, No, really no passing upside, to be honest with you. He doesn't have a great arm, it's mediocre. So basically, exactly like every other quarterback the Texans have had since I can remember. So it'll be one of those situations where I'm assuming Savage is gonna open the season as a starter, but every single time he messes up, throws an incomplete pass, throws an interception, the fans are gonna let Bill O'Brien know about it. They're gonna want Deshaun Watson out there, which is what I want. Sure, Watson has his flaws. Any analyst is gonna pick him apart, but they also do that with every single quarterback in the first round drafted since fucking Nam. Except for Andrew Luck, he was the golden boy. Zero problems with him. Watson's a two-time Heisman finalist. Brings a dynamic to his offense that I really believe will turn things around. He's a good blend of, of size and speed for the position. He's like 6'3", 220. Also runs a 4'6", 6'40", which is very good for quarterbacks. And he utilizes that speed. He, he rushed for 26 touchdowns in, and 35 college starts, along with the, the 17 billion passing touchdowns he had throughout college. He's just 21 years old, really solid arm strength, accuracy, athleticism. You know, his questionable on-field decisions are what makes him probably behind Savage. He, he forces some throws. He's not always kind of plugged in and focused, and he makes some bad mistakes. But all the, all the tangibles are definitely there for him. And I think the intangibles are something that works in his favor as well, because he's a winner. He's a proven winner. And that's why Bill O'Brien wanted him so bad. You know, if I had to bet both of these guys, Savage and Watson, are both going to be making starts in 2017, I would love to see Watson be able to get double-digit starts. I think it's a nice boost for DeAndre Hopkins, because I think Watson will let the ball fly. But regardless of who's under center, um, this is not going to be a high-flying offense. You know, Houston has ranked top six in rushing attempts in each of the last three seasons under Bill O'Brien. Uh, you have J.J. Watt returning. They're going to have one of the best defenses in the league. They're not going away from that, that ground and pound, hard-nosed defense anytime soon. So their quarterback position as a whole is not going to be asked to do much. They're never going to ask the quarterback to put the game on their back. If anything, it's a game manager kind of position. But I think if Watson can get that start, 
I think he's a solid flyer in two QB leagues. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. I think they're both going undrafted right now, and you're not picking them in a redraft league or anything. But I, I really would love to see what Watson does if he can get that, that starting spot. Who are these guys are going to be throwing to? Obviously, we have DeAndre Hopkins. Widely viewed as a top uh, first-round pick last year. I saw him go off the board as early as five or six in a few of the drafts last year. Did not make his owners happy. He finished as wide receiver 29 half-point PPR. His current ADP is going 24th overall, wide receiver 12. I'm so off that ADP. I, I would never be drafting Hopkins there. You know, fantasy owners are continuing to chase Hopkins' numbers from the first half of 2015, which just aren't reality for him anymore. You know, you can say what you want about Osweiler ruining Hopkins' year last year or any of the other Houston wide receivers' fantasy season last year, you know, but his touchdown total in 2015, where he had that elite year, 11, is actually an outlier for Hopkins. You know, he scored twice during his rookie season in 2013, only six times in 2014, and four times last year. So he's never been a huge part of their scoring offense. He's never been a huge part of their goal line offense, even in 2015 when he scored 11 times. When you look at you know, how they use him down there in the, in the 10 zone, he's seen six targets inside the 10 zone in three of the four seasons that he's been in the league. So 2013, 2015, and 2016, he saw only six targets inside the 10 yard line. And in 2014, he saw just one. They simply just don't throw enough on that part of the field for fantasy owners to be able to rely on consistent touchdown production from Hopkins. And when you're picking a guy at that at that price, right, in the, in top 25, you want a guy that has big touchdown upside at least. And and don't, don't get me wrong, I think DeAndre Hopkins is an elite talent. I think he's an absolute animal on the on the outside. I think you put him on the right team and he's easily a top 5 fantasy wide receiver again, but I think that 2015 season was an outlier and the questions at quarterback are not going to magically go away. So basically what I'm saying is, you know, we've seen a ceiling, we've seen his floor, and I don't think his ceiling is attainable again. Finished as wide receiver 29 last year, is going as wide receiver 12. I mean, he's still a candidate for 135, 140 targets. I would imagine he settles somewhere in between his 2014 numbers and his 2016 numbers. If you average them out, you know, it it's, it's comes down to 77 catches, 1080 receiving yards, and about five touchdowns on 139 targets. So, you know, you average those two years out and you're still getting 140 targets, but the actual stat lines themselves aren't anything crazy. That would have landed him as wide receiver 20 in last year, in 2016. 77 catches, 1,082 receiving yards, five touchdowns, I think is very reasonable for what you can expect from Hopkins, given the questions at quarterback, given how they run their offense and how they're going to be looking to slow the game down with their defense being overpowering and just using the run game a lot. So people banking on that first half of the 2015 season where he had unbelievable pace are just not being realistic. In fact, we look back to last season, right? A few weeks into the season, and I'm asking myself, like, who is the wide receiver to own in Houston? Is it DeAndre Hopkins or is it Will Fuller? They took Will Fuller, first round pick last season, out of Notre Dame, can absolutely blow the top off of defenses. First two games as a rookie, 200 yard games, combined for 19 catches, 323 yards, and two scores over the first four games. He was a top 15 wide receiver in fantasy. And then I woke up. Thanks to shitty quarterback play in Houston, a plethora of lower body injuries, and seven drops, didn't top 60 yards or score a single touchdown in any of their remaining 12 games, including the playoffs. Right now he's going at pick 155, wide receiver 56. I'm definitely not ready to just write this kid off. We've seen his potential. We've seen what he could do on the outside. He is a great deep threat, right? 4 3 2 40 yard speech. That's elite in the NFL. What I think he needs to do, of course, is work on, on his focus. He needs to work on the drops because that's something that plagued them coming out of college, and a lot of analysts were concerned about that. And then then it came to fruition when he when he entered the NFL. And that's something that, that can stick with players. And most of the time, I wouldn't say drops like a huge deal. You see guys like Crabtree constantly up there and leading the league in drops. The thing is, Will Fuller. The majority of his targets comes on deep balls, right? So if you're only getting a, a two, three of those a game, and you drop one or two of them, like that's going to kill your production. If you're Michael Crabtree, you know you're getting nine yard slant routes. You drop it; it's not the end of the world. You're missing out on like 0.9 fantasy points. But you drop a 40 yard pass; it could go for a score. That's the difference between being wide receiver 45 and wide receiver 25. That's my concern with Fuller. But like I said, I'm definitely not ready to just write him off, especially if Watson can win that job. I'd like to see what Watson, Fuller, and DeAndre Hopkins can do together. And you're getting him for like a 14th or 15th round pick, so 
someone to keep an eye on in deeper leagues. And after him, you have Braxton Miller and Jalen Strong. Both guys going undrafted, as they should be. They combined to play in 15 games last year and saw a total of 52 targets after being the 14th heaviest passing team in the league. The wide receiver coach there in Houston named John Perry said that Braxton Miller is going to be running a lot from the slot this year, which could benefit him. Uh, you know, he's a quarterback turned wide receiver. He's very, very good athlete. And, you know, putting a bigger guy in the slot is something that sometimes, you know, it, it, it could work out well. It could be a nice PPR play. Realistically, I don't see either of them making any sort of impact as the wide receiver three in an offense that is going to look to run the ball a lot more. Not on the wide receiver core, but as a tight end, C.J. Fedorowicz, he actually impressed last year. You know, he earned the starting role by the by week four, by the end of the week four, and he flirted with tight end one numbers for the rest of the season. He was like quietly, a lot of people are probably don't even know who he is. They would not know him if it weren't for fantasy football. He's an okay athlete, an above average blocker, really good size, 6'6", like 255, and he should see plenty of play time. He should be their, their like full-time starting tight end. It is hard to predict his kind of fantasy outlook this year without knowing who's under center because him and Osweiler, I know this is the... <laughs> Extremely rare, but him and Osweiler actually had some chemistry and had a connection. So when you look at the opportunity he had, he was uh, the 10th most targeted tight end in the NFL. And that's despite missing the first game. And that is with seeing only nine targets through the first four weeks of the season. So you can see how heavily utilized he was used from like week five on. So the opportunity can definitely be there. He also led the team in red zone targets, 12. And like I said, the red zone targets are not something I go crazy about. But you look at the target inside the 10, he had seven of them, which also led the team. I would say it's definitely better if Watson had wins the job because, you know, rookie, tight, uh, rookie quarterbacks usually rely on the tight end. But I think Savage probably, just given his skill set, would probably rely on the tight end as well, not taking too many shots down the field. We literally have a one-game sample size of them two playing together, Savage and Fed, last year. He caught four passes on seven targets for 42 yards, so nothing crazy. He's going off the board, wide receiver, uh, tight end 20. 156 overall. So you're getting a, a low ceiling, high floor kind of guy. He's almost like a Jason Witten in this offense with a little more upside just because he's like younger and he can move around a lot better. But it, again, it's, it's an offense that projects to run the ball a lot without scoring a ton. So it, it's definitely possible to return tight end value, especially in PPR leagues, because like I said, he saw a lot of targets and he probably should see a lot of targets going into this year. But I would definitely look elsewhere because I, I personally love drafting tight ends with high upside which I don't really see in Fedorowicz. You have a guy like David Njoku going one spot ahead of him. You have Cameron Brait going after him and Evan Engram, which I would take probably all three guys ahead of Fedorowicz. Cameron Brait has like eight to 10 touchdown upside. As we saw last year, he dominated inside the 10. Evan Engram, the high flying offense, should be passing the ball a ton. So, you know, I'm pretty off Fedorowicz, but he's maybe someone you could use in best ball leagues as a, as a tight end too. And now we move to the juicy pots, the running backs. I find myself saying that like every video. I'm like, oh, and now we move over to the good parts, the running backs. It's all about the bikes. It's all about the backs. So I was already in love with Lamar Miller coming into the season with his ADP of 28, right? Running back 12 off the board. Now the news comes out that their third round rookie pick, Deonta Foreman, had a run in with the police, unlawful weapons charge, possession of, of marijuana. So now I'm officially infatuated with Lamar Miller's ADP. Foreman was a 2,000 yard rusher at Texas, brought in to kind of lighten Lamar Miller's workload, right? Lamar Miller was obviously stupid effective in Miami, uh, got a huge workload last year, and you saw his effectiveness really, really, really come down. It's hard to say what's gonna happen with Foreman here because, you know, like, I'm, I'm not a fucking lawyer. But I, I would say the NFL, in it, for discipline purposes, usually waits until all of like the legal like police work is completely done before they want to hand out a punishment. You can see how long this shit with Zeke is taking, although there's no, I don't think there's any charges left in terms of the police, even though, I don't know, there might be, but usually the NFL waits a long time. So it's possible they go into the year with this still being on the back of Foreman's head, but no consequences come yet. I know they tested him for uh, he tested negative for marijuana. I guess he wasn't high, that's all that's saying, but he still has these other things going on with him. So regardless of, of, of the legal news, he came into camp out of shape. Six foot, 235 pounds. Uh, and this was from Bill O'Brien himself. He said he's out of shape and he needs to get in shape. Regardless, part two, Foreman's actually one of the few backs in fantasy I would consider a handcuff. Because if he can, you know, if he can go into the season without any legal repercussions from what's happening or NFL suspensions or anything like that, and he can, you know, get in shape, which he's had plenty of time to do so since Bill O'Brien said that, 
he's one of the guys that I actually look at, at as someone who would actually take over the featured back role if the guy ahead of him got hurt, Lamar Miller. Right, there's not a lot of guys you could say that for. And Foreman's going off the board 182nd overall, so so you're not using anything on him besides a last round pick. But to get into Miller, to get into my guy this year, he was widely viewed as a first round pick last year. You know, late late first, maybe early second. He definitely disappointed a little bit. Finished his fantasy's RB16, so not terrible, but not great. Scored just five rushing touchdowns despite being like their clear, clear cut workhorse. But this year at pick 28, you're getting the same exact guy with the same basically outlook and projection for a round and a half to two rounds later. I know Miller was stupidly inefficient last year, right? You saw a career high 268 carries in just 14 games. His yards per carry dipped from 4.6, which was from 2013 to 2015, down to 4.0 behind PFF's 29th ranked offensive line. So they did not have a good line. They had terrible quarterback play. There was not a lot of holes for Miller to really run through, right? It, the offense just imploded under Brock Osweiler. And now with these new quarterbacks kind of battling out, right? They're gonna be looking to keep things simple. A lot of underneath routes, a lot of dump offs, I'm sure to Lamar Miller, which I think is an upside play for him. Miller's almost like guaranteed 240 to 260 touches at worst. And you look at how he was involved in the receiving game last year, right? He caught just 31 passes, which was his lowest season total since 2013. And like I said, with the new quarterback, they're not going to ask to do too much. They're going to utilize their running backs in the receiving game, I believe, a little bit more. And I think his 31 catches should bounce back up to around 38, 40 in, in that range. And where I think there's even more opportunity is near, is near the end zone. The Texas attempted 30 passes last year inside the opponent's 10-yard line. 30. Guess how many targets out of those 30 Lamar Miller got? That many. He got zero targets inside the 10 yard line. Safe to say that number doesn't replicate itself in 2017, right? He's gonna, he's gonna have to see more passing work than he saw last year just by default. And another opportunity I see is not just receiving work by the goal line, it's, it's rushing work, right? He saw eight carries inside the five yard line last year, which is tied for 21st in the NFL amongst backs despite being the sixth most voluminous, voluminous back. So you have the sixth most carries in the NFL, but only the 21st most carries inside the five yard line. And Miller's always been really good that part of the field, in, inside the five, right? Last year, although we only got eight carries there, he scored five times, five tutties. The year before that, he went four for six, four tutties inside the five yard line. So the fact that Houston chose to pass the ball down there instead of running the ball with him or instead of passing the ball to him, just tells me it was pretty poor play, call, play calling in my opinion. And I think they should look to turn that around because that's something obviously they're gonna notice that was a poor part of their offensive plan last year. So I see a lot of opportunity for Miller, for someone who's got such a safe floor with the touches. The bottom line here is this, right? The QB position, no matter who is there, is gonna be an upgrade from Brock Osweiler. They're gonna have more scoring opportunities in my opinion. They get JJ Watt back on defense. They're going to be one of the best defensive groups in the NFL. They're gonna to look to utilize the ground game and play on the back of their defense. Their defense almost guarantees that they keep games very close, meaning that it's never gonna be a pass-friendly script, right? They should always keep the games close, meaning that rushes are going to be plentiful throughout the game. They've been one of the most run-heavy teams over the last three years under Bill O'Brien. A slight uptick in that opportunity for Miller in that, in that inside the five, inside the 10 zone, takes him easily from RB2 to an RB1 and returns a great value where he's being picked right now. As I stated before, I like Foreman to back him up, but they also have Alfred Blue, who has never been good in the NFL. He's never been efficient. He's put up a few big fantasy weeks over the last couple years just on volume alone. If he's not getting 25 carries in a game, he's not doing shit for you. So I would expect it'd be Miller, Foreman, Blue as the pecking order, and I love Miller this year for where he's going off the board. You heard it here first. So in, in the range of, the, uh, of that draft, like picks 25 to 28, there's a lot of question marks there. Guys like Alshon, Sammy Watkins, Brandon Cooks, Todd Gurley's even. I think Miller's like probably the safest play and he's got good upside. So he's my boy this year. That's gonna wrap up the Houston Texans outlook. And the question as always, over under Miller total touchdowns. Actually, I'm gonna look this up on Vegas first. See if I can find this, if they have like a bet on it. And I can't really find any good ones. One I found was the most rushing yards regular season. So Le'Veon Bell is the leader. David Johnson is a heavy underdog to Le'Veon Bell and Zeke. Jordan Howard's fourth, DeMarco Murray fifth. Jay Jai, LaShawn McCoy, Melvin Gordon, Todd Gurley, Devonta Freeman, Marshawn Lynch, Leonard Fournette, 
Then Lamar Miller. So he's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteenth best odds to lead the league in rushing. They don't have touchdown totals on here, but I would set the over under for touch total touchdowns at seven and a half. I'm taking the over here. That's it. Follow me on Twitter. Go subscribe to the blog. Go check out the shop. All that good stuff. And I'll see y'all in the next episode in about two hours. Mm -hmm.